Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those of you joining us in different time zones. And my name is Ibrahim Efe from Kili Siedi Aralık University. I'm also the assistant editor of Inside Turkey. I'm very delighted to welcome our global audience to the second web panel looking at disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean. After publishing our 2021 winter issue entitled New Geopolitics in the Eastern Mediterranean, last week we organized a panel focusing on the uh, energy equation in the region. And today's panel aims to elaborate on the political and legal aspects and dimensions of the disputes. Although the importance of the issue seems to have waned in international and national media, I'm pretty sure today's topic is on a lot of people's minds and especially on those who have read our final issue. So we are delighted to have a stellar panel of experts with us to help us navigate through these complex disputes that have overlapped with natural gas discoveries in the region to create a volatile environment. Before we get started, I would like to remind you all that today's panel is broadcast live on SETA YouTube channel and social media accounts of Inside Turkey. And it is also being recorded and will be available soon on our website and social media accounts. Also, a reminder to our audience, you will be able to ask your questions through the comment function on YouTube or please post them directly to our social media accounts. Now I'll start with Professor Yujal Ajar, who, sorry, Yujal Ajar, who is a professor of international law based in Ankara Yildirim Beyazıt University. Professor Ajar's expertise lies within international maritime law, international law on armed conflicts and international human rights law. He has widely published on these topics in leading academic journals, national and international publishing houses. And last but not least, he is the author of a well-known book entitled The Aging Maritime Disputes and International Law, published by Rutledge in 2003. He is currently the head of the Department of International Law at the Law Faculty of Ankara, Yildirim Beyazıt University. Professor Ajar contributed to our last issue with a research article on Turkey's legal approach to maritime boundary del delimitation in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. We are very happy to have him with us today. So the floor is yours, Professor Ajar. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to first of all thank SETA for this valuable organization. Uh, I'm sure it's going to contribute uh, to the well understanding of the maritime disputes in, in Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, let me start with, with an introduction. Uh, my presentation is, is I'm going to concern the basically the legal aspects of um, maritime disputes in, in Eastern Mediterranean Sea and basically focusing on the legal approach of Turkey. Um, as a start, we have to say that Mediterranean Sea is actually a, a, a narrow enclosed sea. So it is quite relatively narrow and surrounded by many countries. So that means there is a need to separate the maritime areas of, uh, of surrounding countries. That's the actual basic reason why we should have maritime boundaries in Eastern Mediterranean Sea and in, in, in the Mediterranean Sea as a whole. Uh, of course, that disputes actually basically concern the delimitation of a continental shelf and exclusive economic zone because these maritime areas are quite extensive in extent compared to territorial waters, which is, you know, goes up to maximum 12 miles uh, from the shore. But continental shelf and exclusive economic zone are quite extensive areas. They can go up to 200 miles from the shore. That's why we have um, uh, a, a dispute, actually, or many disputes concerning the maritime boundaries uh, to delimit the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. The, the thing is, since we have, uh, you know, we have to delimit these maritime areas, the problem is the surrounding countries are actually, especially in the, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, have many, you know, conflicting views about these boundaries. So it's not really a straightforward issue to have maritime boundaries 
actually we have quite serious, you know, a conflicting uh, approaches of the surrounding countries. Uh, some of these disputes concern the already established maritime boundaries, actually. There are certain agreements, international agreements or bilateral agreements, which established certain uh, boundaries in certain areas of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Actually, this is uh, one of the two parts of the disputed matter. The thing is that these boundaries, established boundaries, are actually under dispute itself. Some countries are against these agreements. That's the first part. The second part is that there are still many undelimited maritime areas in, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. That's the second part, actually. We don't have any maritime areas in certain parts. And actually, the related countries are not in agreement about what should be the course of these boundaries. So that's why, you know, since we had certain agreements, that doesn't mean that we have settled this part of the area. Still, uh, these uh, agreements themselves constitute a first part of the of the whole dispute. And actually, since we have these kind of disputes, this create enormous political tension. From time to time, we have serious political confrontations, and sometimes, you know, that may include uh, possibly. You know, people think that this could even include the military confrontation. And luckily, so far, we had only political disputes, political tension. Uh, fortunately, we, we didn't have such military confrontation. We just hoped that we, that would be any. Um, uh, and uh, we have to also emphasize that uh, it's not the only surrounding countries we should blame. Actually, the Mediterranean Sea as a whole, and especially the eastern part, are actually a difficult uh, geographical area to establish maritime boundaries. The main reason that we have uh, such serious disputes about the maritime boundaries is that there are islands in the region. Uh, that's why quite this is a quite technical issue at the moment. It's not only political, but also it's a technical matter and in technically a difficult region. Wherever you have islands in such areas, it's inevitable that the, the related countries end up with a dispute about what should be the you know, effect of these islands on the boundary of the, of the continental shelf or, or exclusive econ economic zone between surrounding countries. So there is no, it's not a surprise that we have such disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, not only because of the political disputes, but also there are technical difficulties as well. From this point, we have to focus on the legal aspect, actually. If there are technically difficult situation, and if the states are not able to agree politically, then it's up to the law to decide what should be the boundaries in such a difficult geographical circumstances. So in this uh, presentation, we are going to concentrate, first of all, what is the Turkish approach, legal approach, actually, concerning these maritime disputes. Let me start with the developments, actually, how this dispute started first, then how it developed so far. There are actually six countries at the moment which declared exclusive economic zone. So exclusive economic zone legally should be declared to have in any maritime area. There are such six countries in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Turkey is not actually among them, but it doesn't really matter because whether you declare or not, you have continental shelf. All the surrounding countries have continental shelf in Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Even if you don't declare exclusive economic zone, it doesn't really matter because the boundaries are actually coincide for both maritime areas. So Turkey, if we have boundaries delimiting the continental shelf, 
that means that it's going to be the boundaries as well for the exclusive economic zone whenever it's declared. There are six countries which declared exclusive economic zone. Well, actually, that's another point that, as you know, that uh, Lib Libya and Turkey signed a delimitation agreement in the Mediterranean Sea. In this agreement, there is a reference to exclusive economic zone. It means that at least in relation to Libya, Turkey also applies exclusive economic zone, especially in relation to Libya. Uh, the first, very first agreement which established the boundary for exclusive economic zone and continental shelf in Eastern Mediterranean Sea was signed in 2003. It was between Egypt and the Greek side of the island of Cyprus. So that was the first delimitation agreement. But actually, it's the actually the the real start of the disputes in the region. So these two sides uh, signed a delimitation agreement without Turkey's involvement. And also, Turkey did not really receive this agreement as in accordance with international law for many reasons. That's why there was an objection, an official objection from Turkish side against this agreement and against this boundary established by that agreement. So that was the starting point actually in 2003. Despite this Turkish objection, actually Greek side continued to sign similar agreements with neighboring countries. The second agreement was with Lib Lebanon actually, although the this agreement did not came into the force, but it was a second step by the Greek side, uh, despite the Turkish objection, um, legal objection actually, an official of the objection. And later on, uh, in 2011, the Greek side, Greek side of the island signed another delimitation agreement, it was the, the third delimitation agreement, and this, this time it was with Israel in 2011. All these agreements was, rece was received by Turkey as in contradiction with the relevant rules of international law. Uh, we will get some details about this. And on the other side, on, on, the, on the other side, Turkey um, initially uh, issued official objections, objections to these agreements, but Turkey did not stay there and also took some practical measures against the application of these agreements, actually. We, can, we could, you know, see that Turkey is actually uh, carrying out some um, resource-related exploration activities in the region, uh, disregarding the boundaries established by these objective uh, treaties. And also, Turkey took another step to prevent any um, resource-related activities by other countries in the areas which is regarded as Turkish continental shelf. This area was actually in the west of the island of Cyprus, and Turkey considered that section of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea as the Turkish continental shelf. So, um, there are some other developments concerning the bilateral agreements. Actually, another step was taken between Turkey and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus in 2011. Uh, both sides actually sign an agreement uh, to delimit the continental shelf between island of Cyprus and island of um, uh, island of Cyprus and Turkish mainland. So there is an officially delimited area in the north of the island of Cyprus between Turkish mainland. So that was the another delimitation agreement in 2011. And a, another step was again taken by Turkey and in, in 2019, Turkey and Libya signed an agreement in the west part of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea to establish an exclusive economic zone and a continental shelf boundary. The last step was taken by Greece and Egypt, 
uh, they signed an agreement in 2020, in August 2020, to establish an ex exclusive economic zone boundary. All these agreements signed by Greece, uh, uh, Greek side of uh, island of Cyprus and Egypt were all objected to by Turkey legally and officially. Let's look at another issue concerning the Turkish approach. What is the areas claimed by Turkey in Eastern Mediterranean Sea as its own continental shelf? We can see that there are a lot of official statements by Turkey. Most of, most of them sent to the United Nations to, to demonstrate the Turkish approach. Actually, it started 2004 until now. There are count, countless of uh, official letters and statements sent to the United Nations to demonstrate the Turkish approach or the areas that Turkey claims. Uh, after all these statements, Turkey even published the official map and sent it to the United Nations in 2020, in March 2020. And this map shows all the boundaries that Turkey regards at, at it's as its uh, continent, continental shelf boundaries. So there is a clear uh, official position of Turkey, uh, which areas are regarded as a Turkish continental shelf. That's quite clear and officially sent to the United Nations. Uh, and the, the last point, actually, we should uh, look at uh, concerning the Turkish legal approach is what if, what are the Turkish legal justifications or arguments to support or to legitimize the Turkish claims in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea? The first point is actually concerns the delimitation uh, law itself. Turkey says that there is no distinction between the conventional rule and customary rule concerning the delimitation of the maritime areas. That means even if Turkey is not a party to the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, still the rule in that convention is actually the rule of uh, customary law and also bound, bounds all countries. And according to Turkey, that's the second point, the rule is, is that the delimitation should be done with an agreement, with an agreement between related states to establish an equitable boundary. That's the requirement of, of law, according to Turkey. So the boundary should be an equitable one and should be done by an international agreement. And also taking into account all the related circumstances on, or factors of the region. That's the Turkish perception. And of course, that's almost exactly the the, the approach that international courts actually endorse that that's the international law on maritime delimitation. Another point in Turkish approach is that in a semi-enclosed or enclosed seas, that's a legal requirement that state should, states should cooperate when they are establishing the boundaries. And this rule, this legal obligation was violated by first by Egypt and the Greek side of the island of Cyprus, because they didn't even consult Turkey when they are establishing a boundary which actually entered into the possible continental shelf areas of Turkey. That's another point in Turkish legal approach. Another significant point is that as against the Greek approach uh, concerning the delimitation areas, the, the rule of equidistance or method of equidistance, equidistance is not compulsory in legal terms. That's one of the many possible delimitation methods which should be applied when it produces an equitable delimitation. And according to Turkey, it's not a um, right method in, in Eastern Mediterranean Sea because it doesn't produce an equitable delimitation, especially between Greece and Turkey, and also between Greek side of Ireland and Turkey. So equidistance is not the right or is not the legal 
appropriate method in Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, why Turkey is actually uh, claimed that the Greek islands uh, in the region should not have continental shelf and con exclusive economic zone. There are two principles actually Turkey depends on. The first one is the, the coastal land, which is called the proportionality principle. So if you have a longer coastlines, you, as a requirement of equity, you should have more maritime areas. That's the first principle. The second principle is that there should be no cutoff effect on the coastal projection of a mainland. So the islands cannot cut off the coastal projections of mainland coast. That's the another uh, legal rule Turkey depends. Actually, these rules are highly dependent on all the in all the uh, international judicial decisions concerning the maritime areas. I should mention here. And, and a last point actually we should actually concentrate is the role of islands in, um, in the delimitation in Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Turkey basically says that since the islands are cutting off the Turkish mainland's projection, that includes the island of Cyprus as well. So giving full effect, full maritime areas to these islands, that includes the island of Cyprus and islands of of Greece in, in the western part of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, all of them will produce a cutoff effect on the Turkish mainland's projects, and which is not going to be an equitable one. Then. Another point is that compared to Turkey's mainland coastal land in the region, an island of Cyprus and all other Greek islands have actually significantly short coastlines and that's why they have to be mostly in ignored and they should be given territorial waters but no more than this that's the turkish legal uh, approach i think i'm coming to the end of the end of my time actually uh, i just try to summarize what is the main points in the turkish approach legal approach if there would be some questions i would be happy to answer giving more details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ajar. Your presentation has set up the uh, background on which the following presentations will unfold and will hopefully have a deeper uh, discussion on the Turkish legal arguments you have just elaborated on uh, through the end of the uh, panel. Now, next we will have Professor Vishne Korkmaz, who is a professor of international relations at Nishantashi University. She is the vice director of a research center called Center of Mediterranean Security. Her research interests cover international relations theories, foreign policy theories, regional security and security issues, Russian, American and Turkish foreign policy. She is the author of several books and has published sev several scholarly papers, chapters and articles on these issues, including newly launched contributions in New Geopolitical Realities for Russia from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, published by Lexington in 2019, and in Iran's Interregional Dynamics in the Near East, published by Peter Lang in 2021. Uh, Professor Korkmaz contributed to our final issue with a research article which was co-authored with Professor Nushin uh, Ateşoğlu and their article dealt with the new alliance formation in the mm. Eastern Mediterranean Cold War, as they name it. Mm -hmm. we, and the, the research article, which I enjoyed reading uh, a lot, uh, had a particular focus on the Abraham Accord, so I'm very excited to listen to your elaboration on the paper. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon and good evening to our listeners. And I also uh, thank uh, SETA Foundation and Inside Turkey for the publication of this uh, very timely special issue and kind 
uh, invitation to, uh, for me to um, uh, speak about my uh, contribution to this uh, issue together with written together with Professor Nushin Güney. As you mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, just uh, now, uh, this uh, contribution is about uh, geopolitical, new geopolitical dynamics of Eastern Mediterranean. We try to understand what kind of change occur in the region uh, and what kind and how this change uh, um, is affecting and will affect the alliance patterns in the region because uh, as uh, numbers of scholars and speakers today and uh, on occasional basis talk about the uh, energy uh, or the energy game in the region is not about the energy issue actually is not only related to energy issue as professor Lujar uh, mentioned it there uh, uh, there is certain legal aspect of it but apart from on this legal aspect the issue is related to uh, on the one hand the sovereignty uh, issues and uh, uh, sovereignty um, concerns of the uh, regional actors and on the other hand it is related to uh, the competition among the actors related to uh, having control and access uh, over the certain areas, uh, in the certain geographical areas in the region. Uh, in this uh, paper, uh, we uh, think uh, that um, in order to understand these new uh, geopolitical dynamics, which we should adapt uh, at least two level analysis. Uh, uh, and uh, in this two level analysis, uh, on the strategic uh, level, um, we uh, uh, assume that a new Cold War is actually uh, arriving to uh, Eastern Mediterranean. This new Cold War term uh, has been uh, used uh, on occasional basis today uh, by politicians, by uh, scholars, by uh, regular people on the uh, ground. Uh, uh, what we uh, uh, actually mean uh, by using this term is not, of course, um, the return of the old Cold War to the area, to the uh, region, but uh, we actually underline that a new kind of geopolitical competition uh, emerge uh, between great powers and uh, the core of this new uh, geopolitical uh, competition in the region according to us is related to area uh, denial and uh, anti-access capabilities area control capabilities of russia and china which emerge as rival powers of uh, united states of america this is not just because the developing capabilities of China and Russia, but also it is because of the neglect and uh, ignore strategic ignorance of the United States. Because yes, uh, actually during the Obama uh, administration period, actually missed the chance of uh, unipolar, unilateral moment uh, in the region. Uh, Obama, we in, uh, know that the Obama administration actually at that time uh, tried to uh, uh, announce some initiatives. Uh, he and his, his administration draw some uh, red lines related to Syria, uh, took some initiatives related to normalization of relations between Israel and Turkey, normalization of relations between uh, Northern uh, Cypriot and Southern Cypriot by using the um, uh, reward uh, he uh, expected to generate from the energy cooperation uh, among the players. But at the end, we know the story, uh, the end of the story, at the end, he was uh, failed 
to generate such kind of uh, cooperative scheme uh, in the region, mainly because uh, he uh, skipped or ignored the uh, sovereignty issue uh, and the security concerns uh, emerge uh, in the inter-regional uh, basis, uh, inter-actor um, uh, uh, basis in the region. Um, it, uh, at the end, uh, when we arrived to uh, Trump era and then Biden era, we uh, actually, uh, uh, on an uh, accelerating basis, uh, can observe the uh, strength of the competition uh, between uh, Russia, China, and uh, United States. Uh, because of the existence of Russia and China, strategic presence of Russia and China in the, this region. Uh, on the regional level, uh, we uh, can observe uh, a kind of, uh, again, competition among regional players. These players are very eager uh, to develop their own uh, anti-access area denial capabilities like the great powers. Uh, they uh, want to uh, increase their own power base, their influence base, uh, their strategic gains in the regions. In the region, uh, therefore, they uh, are eager to bandwagon the great powers, especially the U.S. because U.S. Um, when uh, we uh, arrive at Trump area, U.S. Uh, under the concerns and worries related to uh, area denial and uh, area control uh, strategies and capabilities of the rival powers, it, uh, U.S. tried to instrumentalize uh, these uh, regional, the uh, strategies of these regional players in the uh, regional base. Uh, the major strategy of regional players is uh, 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 related to realignments. Uh, we call them uh, axis or uh, alignment axis. Uh, this alignment axis, uh, we can uh, we can observe uh, three uh, basic alignment axes in the region. Uh, the first axis uh, is uh, famous energy axis. Um, uh, we can see the collaboration between uh, Israel, uh, Greece, Greek Cypriots, and uh, Egypt. Uh, around the project of Eastern uh, Mediterranean Partnership and EastMed Pipeline Project. Um, and this the, uh, the main character of this alliance uh, is the, uh, uh, its uh, concerns related to Turkish uh, 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 research and uh, together with the research capabilities, uh, area, uh, area denial capabilities in the region. Uh, by using these capabilities as excuse, uh, this uh, alignment tried to exclude Turkey and Turkey Turkish uh, Northern Cypri Cypriots from the uh, energy equation game. Uh, on the other hand, connected to this uh, alliance, uh, we have another second alliance uh, axis, uh, which is uh, Libyan axis. In Libya also we can see uh, different regional players uh, like France, uh, United uh, Arab Emirates, Egypt again, uh, Russia uh, and Israel, they also uh, uh, supported uh, by different me uh, means, supported uh, Khalifa Haftar uh, uh, in order to exclude now or wither the influence uh, area of uh, government of national accord, both militarily and politically in the region. And by this way, they also try to balance Turkey's increasing activities and increasing influence in the region. Um, uh, uh, United States of America, when uh, he 
uh, when Washington DC decided to return back to the uh, region in order to constrain the uh, strategic areas that gained by Russia and China in the region, uh, use these uh, alliances as instrument to uh, flourish its own influence in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Why uh, Washington DC preferred to use them? Because by using these alliances actually uh, reduce the cost of balancing, uh, manage the risk of confrontation, so uh, they are uh, risk-free and cost-free instruments for uh, USA and they are simply there, they are existing on their own uh, logic. Uh, on the other hand, however, these uh, regional players, eager and ambitious to gain more and more power or more and more influence in the region, also uh, voluntarily choose to bandwagon uh, US strategy of this alliance building or alliance support strategy uh, because they are uh, actually benefit-oriented actors. This, uh, 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 we think both the uh, uh, natural uh, extension of new Cold War dynamic and also the extension of the uh, great power, regional power competition in the region, uh, the alliances uh, emerge on benefit-oriented basis uh, rather than security-oriented basis. Uh, as a, uh, this benefit-oriented nature actually strengthened the polarization in the region, fragmentation in the region, and easily militarized the uh, grant, uh, the uh, alliance logic, uh, and uh, by this way, uh, instrumentalization of these alliances by great powers, uh, in this case USA, uh, became much more easy. Uh, uh, because of this benefit-oriented nature, these alliances are not uh, strong, solid alliances. They are very flexible and they are easily shifting one uh, end to another. Uh, uh, because if the leading actor here can be USA and in some cases can be Israel, uh, if the leading actor can uh, create uh, or flourish the benefits uh, or strategic gain for the regional uh, actors, they will continue to uh, live, uh, but if not, uh, the regional actors uh, will easily search other options or will, uh, will easily tend to other options. Uh, uh, we uh, assume in the paper that uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, these, the alliances emerge within this framework. Therefore, uh, they are benefit-oriented and this benefit-orientation make them uh, in some instances make the regional players in this in some instances make the alliances of regional players in some instances maximalists like Greece, Cypriot or Greece demand in Eastern Mediterranean maritime uh, jurisdiction issues like Israel demand uh, related to naval supremacy or connectivity control uh, in her connectivity control uh, strategy. Uh, these alliances benefit oriented, so uh, this benefit orientation makes the uh, regional players in some instances opportunists, like in the case of United Arab Emirates in Libya, like in case of Greece, uh, again, in Eastern Mediterranean, because, for example, Greece used Sudabai or uh, other uh, issues related to islands and islands maritime uh, exclusive uh, maritime uh, jurisdiction zones issue uh, to turn itself as uh, 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 turn itself uh, as a player of uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Like uh, in the case of France, France uh, wanted to use the Libyan case or Syrian case uh, to provide itself as a sphere of uh, maneuvering. Uh, 
uh, uh, these alliances are benefit oriented and these benefit orientation makes them actually in every uh, in each of these three axes Israel uh, centered uh, and this brings us as actually the uh, uh, famous Abraham Accord uh, axis. Uh, the first and second axis uh, is energy uh, axis and Libyan axis. Um, uh, the the players uh, in this axis uh, try to bend back on USA and. Uh, in this uh, bandwagonic uh, uh, maneuver, in this ma bandwagonic strategy, Israel uh, was thought to be a, a kind of benefit provider uh, for the regional players, either by itself, uh, either by uh, because of its own capabilities, or either as the uh, surrogate. A surrogate think actor of United States of America. Uh, of course, Trump's anti-Iranian policy uh, uh, was helping uh, for this uh, calculation. Uh, besides, uh, uh, Turkey's increasing uh, capabilities in terms of uh, area control, uh, in terms of hedging, in terms of uh, strategic balancing, uh, also create concern uh, uh, among the regional players. And uh, they uh, use this uh, balancing logic uh, a uh, as a kind of uh, excuse for their uh, bandwagoning uh, behavior. Um, uh, but at the end, uh, when we look to the uh, end of the story, uh, and uh, when we ask whether they can achieve, whether they achieved uh, their strategic objective in terms of uh, strategic gain generation, benefit generation, uh, we uh, uh, can easily questionize the. Uh, logic and the uh, uh, functioning of these alliances. Uh, if we uh, look to the first energy axis, uh, the major uh, benefits uh, uh, could be uh, succeeded if the uh, natural gas or the uh, LNG or the uh, LNG derived from the natural gas uh, uh, ex uh, extended from the uh, 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 fields uh, in the eastern Mediterranean and uh, uh, or in form of electricity, whatever uh, the form is. If this this uh, 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 this material uh, uh, would have been sold to uh, uh, European Western markets uh, or uh, Asian markets, then uh, we uh, could uh, argue that, yes, the uh, benefit was generated for the regional players. But we know that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, story, how this story evolved, uh, today uh, neither Israel nor Egypt actually succeeded to uh, sell its gas in uh, whatever form. Uh, to the markets, so uh, they actually failed. Uh, they were failed to uh, generate any kind of strategic profit uh, by uh, aligning. By uh, they they expect from this alignment uh, by making an alignment exclu which excluding Turkey and Northern Cyprus. Uh, in the second axis, uh, the Libyan axis, uh, we uh, uh, actually, uh, we are now in a kind of transition period. Uh, but uh, we uh, uh, now uh, we are sure about the uh, 
Kalife Haftar will not be the sole ruler of the Libya uh, of Libya. That is why uh, this this um, uh, actually uh, this uh, is because of the uh, game changing uh, uh, game changing capacity of Turkey. I want to add uh, two more points related to third axis because at at this point, the third axis emerged, as you mentioned, Abraham Accords axis. Uh, Abraham Accords axis, uh, or uh, Abraham Accords, as we know, uh, uh, were negotiated and created by the United States, by its, uh, by Trump administration, actually. Trump, Trump administration created it and uh, embedded its uh, certain kind of rewards for the participants. Uh, but at that point, uh, before the uh, real benefit generation for the uh, regional players, Trump administration has gone. Uh, Abraham Accords, uh, from the beginning, have certain shortcomings in terms of legis uh, in terms of legitimacy, in terms of what it. Uh, brings uh, to the uh, Israel Arab peace. Uh, it uh, it uh, can be accepted a kind of retreat from uh, 2002 even uh, Arab peace initiative. It demise uh, Palestinian veto power over Israel Arab peace. So it uh, have uh, they have a lot of shortcomings in this regard, but. Uh, is Abraham Eckert's represents uh, a kind of strategic shifting in Israel's thinking from balancing uh, rival um, Arab uh, players to the balancing Turkey because of uh, this opportunistic strategy of Israel to uh, acquire a kind of uh, naval control uh, or connectivity control strategy, whatever it is, pipeline, uh, linkage, internet, cables, whatever uh, it is, electricity, etc. But at the end today, Israel's uh, this strategy uh, cannot be probable actually, uh, because there are other players who have uh, uh, area control capabilities like Russia, like US, but also like Turkey. Uh, so benefits expected from this third axis uh, not guaranteed yet and uh, continue to be blurred under Biden administration's different strategies. But also it's uh, Abraham Eckert's axis uh, when the Biden administration came to power, uh, uh, make it, it their own uh, complications visible. Uh, just one complication I want to mention and uh, jump to the uh, end of the, my presentation from there. Uh, the major complication is that Abraham Eckert's, or, or uh, if we take these three axes together, together with Abraham Eckert's, energy axis and the Libyan axis, uh, they uh, can easily be uh, read as anti-Russian, anti-Chinese, anti-Iranian, anti-Turkic, anti-Muslim Brotherhood. So they create uh, they have potential to create many rivals. And uh, we know the, uh, the similar story from Syria. We know similar story from elsewhere. Uh, so they, uh, this, this kind of polarization, confrontation throughout axis spaces can easily create countermeasures and counterbalancing mechanisms. This is why in order to, uh, for the US, in order to continue it's cost-free, risk-free strategy. U.S. Uh, and the others uh, have to find um, uh, some uh, rapprochement strategy towards the uh, the excluding actors. And Turkey emerged uh, number one target of this rapprochement strategy because, on the one hand, 
she can uh, uh, generate certain benefits for the regional actors. Uh, she call win-win solution for the numbers of problems in the region, if you remember, from the uh, conference diplomacy vision to the energy diplomacy. And Turkey is also uh, is uh, the uh, is uh, is an actor. Uh, who uh, clearly uh, voice uh, his uh, uh, intention to talk about the, all the issues on an inclusive basis. That is why uh, at the end of the paper, which uh, uh, just coincided with the transfer, uh, transition period from Trump to Biden area, uh, at the end of the paper, we uh, expect this kind of rapprochements and this kind of de-escalation uh, strategy in the region, which we can see actually the impetus of them um, today, I think. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Korkmaz. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive recap on the political dimensions uh, of the disputes in the region. Uh, and I think now, having combined the legal and the uh, political dimensions of the disputes and uh, the ambitions of the international actors involved in the conflict, uh, I would say uh, dispute, uh, we can turn to our third panelist, uh, Dr. Ayfer Erdogan, uh, who will provide a combined uh, perspective uh, on the issue from legal and political uh, perspectives, uh, depending on her contribution to our final issue. But please let me introduce Dr. Erdogan to you before she can start her presentation. Uh, Dr. Ayfer Erdogan received her PhD degree from Yildiz Technical University with her dissertation entitled Transitions from Authoritarianism, a comparative analysis between Tunisia and Egypt post-Arab Spring. Her research interests include Middle Eastern politics, <coughs> authoritarianism, <coughs> excuse me, mass movements, regime change, democratic transitions, political Islam, and civil society. Currently, Dr. Erdogan works as a lecturer at the Department of Modern Languages of Yildiz Technical University. She contributed to our final issue also with her. Ayfer Hocam, siz devam edebilirsiniz hocam. Tamam, sanıyorum bir e, sıkıntı oldu. E, teknik bir aksı arkada. Uh, okay. Yes, we lost connection, I think. Uh, okay, I I think the, the, the technical problem lies with my computer, but that's fine. Okay. Uh, no, I had the same problem. I was disconnected as well. Okay. So okay. I think it's a general problem anyway. Um, Yes, Dr. Erdogan contributed to our final issue with a research article which tackles with the legal and political dimensions of the Eastern Mediterranean crisis and the floor is yours now, Dr. Erdogan. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for organizing this uh, panel. Uh, the Eastern Mediterranean crisis is a very uh, timely issue nowadays. And uh, it's very nice to see Vishna Korkmaz here, who was my lecturer during my PhD study. It was a great coincidence in that sense. Uh, so thank you for the previous presentations, they were very insightful. So I would like to talk about uh, the political and the legal dimensions uh, to the issue. So today we know that energy independence lies central to aspect security and foreign policy and also economy. So it's no surprise for us that the coastal states are competing with each other to secure and maximize their interests in the Eastern Mediterranean's uh, potential hydrocarbon reserves. 
So this started in 2009 when Israel discovered three important offshore natural gas fields, uh, Tamar David and Devitian. And then in 2015, Italy's uh, state control gas company, ENI, discovered a uh, Zor gas field uh, close to the Egyptian coast. And this is predicted to be one of the largest ever found uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And the Greek Cypriot administration in 2018, they also found uh, another gas field in the southern uh, sea zone. So, of course, Turkey, driven by these discoveries, uh, Turkey joined the race for hydrocarbon uh, exploration and uh, it sent uh, first seismic vessel by Ross Hyred Tinpasha and then two drilling vessels, Fati and Yavuz, uh, to eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, for hydrocarbon exploration uh, activities. Uh, actually, this move by Turkey has sparked the Eastern Mediterranean crisis uh, because this was when the e European Union uh, started to make pressure uh, on Turkey uh, to hold its hydrocarbon exploration activities, stating that this breached the sovereignty of the uh, Greek Cypriot administration. And the tensions escalated in 2020. Uh, the three countries, uh, France, Turkey, and uh, Greece, uh, they, uh, they were almost on the brink of uh, a military confrontation uh, when France sent uh, jet fighters uh, to the region. And then United Arab Emirates, uh, they it also uh, sent jet fighters uh, to the Mediterranean Sea siding with Greece in a standoff against Turkey. So in a way, uh, what should have remained as a, uh, as a technical issue, as a legal issue, you know, those maritime disputes that, that, uh, that was the case with many other countries before, it uh, suddenly turned into a regional crisis. And there are two uh, critical issues here. Uh, one is, uh, there are divergent claims, contesting claims between Turkey, Greece, and the Greek Cypriot administrations regarding maritime borders. And I would like, I would like to talk a little bit about this uh, referring to the international law. And uh, another aspect concerns the political dimension. And we see in the Eastern Mediterranean crisis that uh, various different countries uh, are engaging in the crisis, even they are far from the region, like France, like United Arab Emirates, and uh, very recently Saudi Arabia. Uh, so we see that various political disputes are coming into the fore here uh, in Eastern Mediterranean. So the most important and the most uh, widely referred document uh, in the international law regarding these maritime disputes is uh, 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And uh, according to this, docu uh, this document, uh, each coastal state and each island has sovereign uh, rights. Uh, they, they have sovereign rights on the sea zones uh, that extends up to 200 nautical miles from their territorial uh, waters. And uh, here, the main challenge is perhaps these zones that each state claims could overlap, which is the case with, with the Turkish-Greek uh, dispute. So uh, when such disputes occur, uh, the Article uh, 57 of the uh, United Nations Convention uh, states that uh, any delimitation between the coastal states should be based on an agreement uh, on, on the basis of uh, equitable solution principle. So this is highly problematic because firstly, it is highly open-ended and it is also very relative. So what is equitable solution for one state? It's not equitable or it's not fair for another. And if the two coastal states cannot agree on a boundary uh, on their uh, maritime zones, then uh, the principle of acute distance or median line uh, is applied between the two coastal states. So here, uh, the median line uh, is drawn between the two coastal states, uh, but the challenge here is whether islands should be given effect, limited effect or no effect uh, while delineating uh, maritime zones, because 
uh, islands or one country could lie on the wrong side of the median night, which is the case with Turkey and Greece now. So here, the Turkish argument is that uh, mainlands of the two countries should be taken as base points uh, while de uh, delimiting uh, maritime zones. Uh, whereas Greece, uh, Greek position uh, states that uh, the uh, Greek islands and the Turkish mainland should be taken as base points while uh, delineating maritime zones. So mainly this is the uh, origin of the uh, legal dispute between the two countries. So uh, we need to also consider uh, the very specific characteristics of the Eastern Mediterranean. So uh, it's a semi-closed sea and it is quite narrow. So, for instance, uh, the distance between the two opposing coasts, uh, even on the longest points of the Mediterranean Sea, is around 300 nautical miles. So, which means that if Turkey, uh, Cyprus, I say the Greek Cypriot uh, administration and uh, Egypt, they all claim 200 nautical miles, that doesn't make sense because uh, the sea is quite narrow. It's only around 300 nautical miles on the longest points. So which shows that these very uh, peculiar specific characteristics of geography uh, comes into the play uh, while uh, trying to solve such uh, disputes. So the case law uh, is also important uh, for us uh, because there are several various disputes uh, between different countries uh, on maritime zones. For instance, the North Continental Shelf case uh, is one of the first and most reputed uh, cases you know, of the International Court of Justice. And here the uh, International Court of Justice decided that an equitable solution cannot be just uh, achieved on the ground of uh, acute distance, but uh, uh, islands cannot also be entitled to maritime zones beyond their territorial borders uh, because in this case uh, they have, there is the risk of exploiting or narrowing down uh, substantially another country's uh, maritime zones. So there are other such cases between, for instance, Libya and Malta, between uh, United Kingdom and uh, France, like the Channel Islands case, uh, Tunisia, Libya, uh, uh, between Bahrain, Qatar, and uh, Ukraine, and uh, uh, Romania. So in each case, uh, there is, I mean, uh, the International Court of Justice is looking at uh, the cost, the length of the cost, for instance, specific geographic characters, the proximity of the island to the mainland, and uh, the population, the size of the island. So there are various, various factors that come into play. So now the Greek argument, for instance, uh, that an island of uh, like Mace uh, should be granted exclusive economic zones just like any continental territory is very groundless and it doesn't make sense because the island is only two kilometers away from Turkey and it is almost like 600 kilometers from the Greek mainland. And uh, if the Greek argument uh, is uh, taken into account, then that would mean this small island should generate a continental shelf area, which is almost 40,000 uh, square kilometers. Uh, it is at least 4,000 4, times uh, larger than the island itself. It is neither uh, rational uh, nor in line with the international law. So another uh, issue uh, that uh, we need to take into account in Eastern Mediterranean crisis, another legal issue is Cyprus issue itself. So we see the revival of decades old conflict in a new context. As you know, it dates back to 1974 when Turkey intervened militarily as one of the guarantee countries and, and uh, from 1917, uh, 1970s, let's say, until now, there has been a lot of attempts uh, to uh, for uh, negotiations and uh, solution, uh, but uh, the the issue remained unsettled until now, and uh, because of the unsettlement of the Cyprus issue. Uh, the Greek Cypriot administration is claiming that, or acting, let's say, 
as uh, it is the sole legitimate authority uh, in Cyprus and it is making unilateral agreements with the third countries and it's issuing a license to international companies. So uh, this sparkles a, a crisis or a, a conflict between Turkey and Cyprus because Turkey claims that uh, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus has also rights, uh, exclusive rights in these contested areas. Uh, in that regard, in 2011, uh, Turkey and uh, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, they signed a continental delimitation agreement and uh, the Turkish Petroleum Corporation was issued a license to explore and exploit uh, oil and uh, hydrocarbon reserves in this area. Uh, the European countries, the southern European countries uh, like Malta, uh, France, Italy, Greece, Portugal and Spain, they issued Valletta Declaration back then and they defined Turkey's activities in Eastern Mediterranean as illegal and they also called the EU to take uh, action against Turkey uh, in solidarity with Cyprus. And then uh, uh, from 2019 uh, onwards, uh, we see two different bilateral agreements uh, which further aggravated tensions in the region. The first one was between Turkey and Libya. Uh, it was a strategic move in that sense because Turkey acts as a game changer in the region's uh, energy puzzle, let's say. Uh, so Turkey not only concluded its western and southern borders, but also prevented a potential agreement that could be signed between Libya and other uh, coastal states in the eastern Mediterranean. And uh, with this agreement, Turkey and Libya also made, them, made it clear that any future agreement or any future partnership would be bound by uh, mutual negotiations. And as a response, uh, Greece and Egypt, they also signed a deal uh, on the delimitation of maritime uh, zones, uh, which is condemned and uh, condemned by Turkey and Libya. And, and they called the agreement as null and void, uh, just like uh, the Southern European states uh, did it for the Turkish uh, Libyan deal. And uh, still, uh, the technical issue given the technical issues and political issues at hand, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, maritime disputes, border disputes, uh, have still continued to uh, pit Turkey against other countries in the region. And uh, the Eastern Mediterranean crisis is actually a reflection of various uh, political uh, conflicts, political issues. Uh, so it is not only about uh, uh, like sharing uh, potential hydrocarbon disputes, sorry, potential hydrocarbon uh, reserves or uh, delimiting borders, maritime zones, but it is mostly about, also about, especially for other regional states, uh, it's about Turkey's uh, policies uh, that largely diverged from the West and uh, the Gulf states also, except Qatar. So uh, the EU and Turkey uh, and also the US uh, has divergent policies uh, because of uh, Turkey's warning relations with uh, Russia and uh, uh, also reflected in pipeline projects such as Turk Stream and Nord Stream and its purchase of S-400 Russian missile defense systems. And this game is a serious blow to the Western countries and NATO allies. So in that sense, we can say that Turkey is seeking to engage in balancing with Russia uh, when it is disappointed by the US and uh, EU in various areas. Uh, it's not just the EU and the US, it, there are also various Middle Eastern countries uh, who have become opposition states who are coalescing against uh, Turkey now in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, one is Egypt, as we know, Turkey and Egypt, uh, the relations, their relations are quite tense these days uh, because of Turkey's uh, uh, support uh, for a Muslim Brotherhood, which, was, which has been a fraternal regime uh, to the Turkish government. Uh, and Turkish government reacted very negatively and launched a campaign for the release of Morsi and uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, members. And uh, it the uh, government also condemned uh, the bloody military coup, 
So um, this has not only affected Turkish-Egyptian relations, but also the Turkish uh, relations, Turkish relations with the Gulf states, uh, except Qatar again, uh, because for the Gulf states, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and it is uh, electoral victory has been uh, quite a survival threat. It, it has been perceived as a survival threat by uh, the Gulf states uh, since the Muslim Brotherhood has offshots in those states. And also the Kashyyyk murder uh, further strained the Turkish-Saudi relations uh, after the uh, Turkish government leaked investigation results pointing to the, uh, to the Saudi regime uh, as uh, the responsible of the murder. So since then, Saudi Arabia uh, has been carrying out a defamation campaign against Turkey. And uh, Syria was, uh, the Turkish-Syrian policies uh, was another area uh, which pit Turkey against other states. So Turkey has been uh, supporting, uh, sorry, Turkey has been uh, struggling against the YPG forces in northern Syria, uh, which is an offshoot, or we can say a branch of PKK. Uh, for Turkey, this is a national secu security issue, whereas uh, the Western powers has been uh, supporting uh, YPG forces uh, against uh, the, their so-called security threat uh, of ISIS. So um, that was the second area in the Middle East uh, for diver divergent policies. And uh, the third area, uh, which has put Turkey at odds with other external actors, like France and United Arab Emirates, for instance, and also Egypt, uh, was the proxy war in Libya. Uh, so the Libya civil conflict, uh, known as the war for Tripoli, uh, it came to an end just after Turkey provided extensive military aid uh, to the uh, government of national accord. Uh, so, in that case, we can say Turkey has turned the tide uh, in favor of the uh, national uh, uh, government of national accord, we can say. Uh, so, these developments have beat Turkey uh, that, uh, and Qatar also, that supported the uh, national accord government against uh, the many European governments and Egypt uh, and United Arab uh, Emirates. So we can say uh, Turkey perhaps is today feeling uh, more alienated and isolated uh, than ever uh, nowadays. Uh, but we, here we have to also uh, keep in mind that, uh, for instance, uh, Greece is also a NATO member state and it has the uh, Russian 300, S-300 missiles in its inventories. And also, in a similar way, uh, for instance, Greece illegally militarized 16 of the 23 islands in the eastern uh, Aegean Sea. And it is also a violation of the Lausanne Peace Treaty and Paris Peace Treaty. Uh, but uh, the one-sided and partial stance by EU and the US uh, just supporting uh, Greece and the Cypriot administration at any case, by any means, it does not bode well uh, for settling the disputes between Greece and Turkey. And uh, it also uh, doesn't bode well for the uh, integration in the Transatlantic Security Alliance. And uh, this also pushed Turkey uh, further away from the uh, Western alliance and away from the NATO and closer to Russia uh, in that sense. I think that's all I could say about the legal and political points uh, because uh, many aspects were uh, already uh, raised by uh, Vishna Korkmaz and uh, Yücel Hoca beforehand. So I don't want to go over them again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Erdan, for this wonderful and illuminating uh, speech indeed. Now, I would like to ask one question for each panelist since we have exceeded our time limit. So, I'd like to start with Yücel Hoca. Um, as you have recounted Turkey's legal arguments on the issue, I mean, they seem to be very compelling, uh, compelling to me, uh, particularly the one on proportionality, uh, which stipulates that an island cannot cut off coastal projections of a main uh, mainland. Uh, 
But as Vishnu Korkmaz Hoca and Ayper Erdan Hoca have explained, the issue is also politically uh, very uh, complicated. So this raises a question in my mind. Is international law the first place to find a viable solution to the problem? Or will it contribute uh, to further complications of the issue? Uh, we can't hear you, Hoja. Uh, Sorry, my voice no, is no slow. Thank you for this quite you know, significant question to understand the legal and political aspects which are quite related, actually. Uh, I have to first of all say that uh, whether you are trying to delimit the maritime areas through international agreements or submitting to an international court, actually doesn't really matter in the sense that in both cases, the parties or the court is applying international law, actually. I mean, let's say Greece and Turkey come together to discuss a maritime boundary, then inevitably they would refer to the rules of international law because, you know, there is no other way to understand what's going to be the course of boundary, which is going to be an acceptable one, an equitable one. And on the other hand, you have to, you know, persuade your uh, countries uh, by depending on international law. I mean, if you just try to depend on the political matters, it's not going to be convincing for the, you know, communities in, in both countries. That's why you have to, in a sense, refer to the rules of international law. I am sure if the parties are really you know, getting to an agreement on the principles of international law uh, as applying to the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, the issues will be easier to settle. Uh, because, you know, as you, as you mentioned, and uh, all other panelists are quite right, they mentioned that the, the political aspects are quite complicated in the region. To clarify the complication, the only viable reference is the legal rules. As Ayfer Erdogan mentioned, uh, the, the legal rule concerning the maritime delimitation is quite a general one, quite a comprehensive one. So it's really difficult to apply this rule to the, to the specific cases. Before, uh, you know, having these uh, so many international court decisions, it would be, in a sense, impossible to understand what's going to be the equitable delimitation. But fortunately, we have a clear idea after you know having so many international court decisions, which is more than 20 at the moment, and we have a clear idea what is equitable one concerning a delimitation of maritime areas. So it is possible to apply these principles developed by, by in the case law, it is quite possible to apply these principles to the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, of course, there would be some, you know, conflicting, you know, interpretation of these rules. That's inevitable. But as long as we stay on the rules of uh, of maritime delimitation, uh, I think it's going to be easier to settle. You know, if we wait for the settlement of the Cyprus disputes before settling the maritime disputes, I think it's, it's going to be taking, taking quite a long time. Uh, just putting aside the political disputes and just concentrating what is an equitable one, I think it would be easier uh, to settle the disputes. Actually, that's the official um, position of Turkey that let's put the Cyprus dispute aside first and get involved the Turkish side as well into the maritime delimitation issues and try to settle an equitable one. I think that would be an easier one. That's why, as as an answer to your question, I think legal rules are actually there to, you know, help an easier solution in the Med Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Thank you very much, Professor Ajar. And now I would like to ask a question to Professor Korkmaz. Uh, Professor Korkmaz, you have mentioned the uh, U.S. initiated Abraham Accords and how it has complicated the issue further. So I'm very curious to 
uh, learn about your take on the new uh, U.S. administration, how it will affect the region. Do you think there will be a radical change during the Biden uh, administration uh, with regard to the uh, Eastern Mediterranean disputes? Okay, thank you. Uh, um, first of all, uh, maybe not a radical change, but a kind of change is occurring, uh, actually. Because uh, this is uh, mainly because of your strategic thinking now is concentrating on balancing the, maybe not the balancing, but constraining uh, its rivals um, area of control. Uh, it is, uh, we already know uh, Biden administration's um, uh, desire to repivot Asia. I mean, in one sense or another, we don't know the, exactly now what kind of um, containment policy or containment policy he or his team will adapt. But we, we expect a kind of containment policy from Biden administration targeting China uh, or ch uh, Chinese rights or Chinese um, assertive policies, uh, because uh, we know also that he put this uh, objective with covert um, uh, explanations in his uh, uh, newly launched document, uh, which is called like Gui guidance of new strategic, uh, new uh, strategic strategy of US or something like that, uh, related to Russia. Uh, Biden administration uh, has to find a way to constrain Russian position in the uh, uh, precious geopolitical points. One is that uh, definitely Eastern Mediterranean, but this constrainment, uh, we, we uh, don't know how this constrainment policy will uh, continue to uh, uh, to turn to be a kind of uh, containment policy, whether it uh, gain containment character or not, we will not be sure about this. Not just because of the uh, uh, whether U.S. will desire it or not. Question: It is uh, related to uh, also uh, whether it is probable, whether is it is possible, or in which uh, cost. Uh, in uh, uh, whether it is a risky uh, strategy or not, the, this uh, also related to these uh, questions and the possible answers of them. And it is not an easy strategy, definitely. Uh, U.S. tried to uh, take some uh, steps uh, about it. Uh, usually, uh, we mentioned, for example, a, a U.S. investment, military investment to Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary, Greece, uh, Greek Cypriots, uh, but we forget that they are actually targeting Russia. Uh, so uh, in this in this environment, uh, okay, since these alignments uh, till now uh, have not produced any tangible results. Uh, uh, about strategic gains, okay? No gas, no money. I mean, no gas transferred to markets, no money uh, gained from them. Uh, 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 no, um, uh, neither uh, United Arab Emirates, nor Egypt, nor uh, France, nor uh, this or that uh, succeeded to gain a hand on Libya. So, I mean, about Russia there still. Uh, Russia in Syria still. Uh, Russia, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, very closely observe what is happening in uh, South uh, Cyprus and Greece related to this uh, Greece, US, uh, uh, Southern Cyprus, Greece connections. So, in this, I mean, within this framework, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Biden administration uh, should uh control the uh escalation risks in the region because these escalation risks risks may create 
it further complication for Biden administration now not uh, settled containment or constrainment policy for uh, for uh, targeting uh, Russia. Uh, that is why uh, U.S. should uh, think about uh, improving or normalizing relations or how such kind of normalizing relations can be uh, settled between uh, Greece and Turkey because they are NATO uh, allies and between Turkey and U.S. because they are also uh, NATO allies. So U.S., uh, I think, should think about this, but uh, it is not just shoot sentence. Uh, uh, by looking the grant, uh, uh, not only I, but also Professor Güney uh, is thinking about, uh, they, we uh, are thinking about that uh, U.S. now is, uh, in such kind of position to try to revise how, uh, or uh, try to uh, answer the question how she will revise its uh, this three axis strategy. And actually, according to me, Biden administration's anti-Trump Trump, uh, uh, discourse actually uh, is uh, a, a fascinating uh, factor for this because uh, blaming Trump uh, on this issue is an easy way to start this revision process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this answer takes me to my last question uh, for Dr. Erdogan, uh, is there a one-size-fits-all uh, solution to the uh, conflict in the region? I mean, will new agreements and negotiation attempts uh, solve the situation uh, for um, the benefit of all parties, or will we have another protracted uh, crisis in the region? Uh, I do not see, uh, unfortunately, I do not see one-size-fits-all solution in this case, because uh, I mean, Turkey is uh, pressured by various states uh, to make concessions, but an equitable solution or a fair solution could be only achieved when parties, all parties, make concessions uh, to a certain extent. So what we see, for instance, in the Turkish-Libyan deal and the Egyptian-Greek deal, you see that all parties are trying to maximize their positions. Uh, so this maximalist, put, uh, this maximalist position or uh, approach is uh, taking this uh, all sides away from a realistic solution, realistic approach. Uh, for instance, the Turkish-Libyan deal, uh, it uh, undermines the uh, maritime zones of Crete Island. Uh, and uh, for instance, the Egyptian-Greek uh, deal, on the other hand, uh, it does not uh, almost it uh, makes Turkey as a, it turns Turkey into an inland state rather than a coastal state. So uh, I do not see that uh, the, these different divergent parties could achieve an equitable solution. It is only possible if a supranational entity like NATO, like the EU, uh, so brings the issue. Uh, and uh, under its uh, under its umbrella, and tries to solve the issue in a uh, in an objective manner. But this also seems very unlikely, especially in the EU, uh, because uh, when they took Cyprus uh, without the Cyprus issue being resolved uh, to the EU, when they when they granted Cyprus uh, membership uh, without the Cyprus issue being uh, settled, uh, so. Turkey lost all the chances, indeed, uh, for itself, uh, because normally in such disputes, uh, both carrots are sticks are used by uh, the by the EU uh, and by such uh, international organizations uh, in order to achieve a solution. But here, uh, all these uh, sticks are lost for Cyprus and uh, nowadays the only solution that they expect is that Turkey gives up all its uh, legitimate uh, and uh, legitimate demands, legitimate uh, arguments. And this is not something uh, that's also feasible.
So I think there is also another technical problem. <laughs> so I see my uh, lecturer from the PhD. It's very nice coincidence, Mishnah. Ah, nice to see you here. <laughs> thank you. I, I think it is it is uh, my pleasure, actually. Uh, I'm glad to what you uh, say. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it has been a loss for the university uh, to lose uh, such a lecturer uh, like Mishnah. Okay. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it, it, I'm very glad that we provided this opportunity for you to catch up. <laughs> and I think uh, the final answer uh, provided a perfect ending for the panel. Uh, and as it seems, the subject is not going anywhere soon and it's not becoming less relevant to Turkey and her interests. And for the other actors uh, which are embroiled in the strategic, politic, uh, political, economic and legal aspects of the disputes. So we will most likely revisit this topic in one of our future issues and panels. Uh, I just want to thank very much uh, Professor Yujal Ajar, Professor Vishna Korkmaz and Dr. Ayfer Ardan for wrapping it up so eloquently. Uh, we will be back with other issues soon, uh, so we will see you all next time on another Inside Turkey web panel. Uh, please keep following us uh, and have a very good uh, 